this morning is starting to look into more detailed methods that from the title uh, is all about valuation. So it's important to go back to the first day, to the first exercise uh, on the snacks to remember <coughs> that we said, well, we have been saying this many times, but there is a difference between a price and a value. So the valuation methods are the methods that try to achieve the willingness to pay. In our exercise, the willingness to pay is your happiness, your score, okay? So your score was 10, and 10 could be transformed in how much would you pay for that banana, despite on the market the banana is 50p, okay? So the market normally, uh, not normally, can have a price that is lower than your willingness to pay. Okay, can be higher, depends on your preferences. So today we focus on the willingness to pay. The willingness to pay, uh, so we talk about the price and yesterday is a, I don't know, Corrado can of course immediately uh, rebate my <laughs> definition. Yesterday we look at a method that in some way was a pricing method. So we had a price and value. The price is coming from the market. So yesterday, we, we saw the exercise where we said, okay, I producing cacao, and the cacao depends on many factors. One of these factors is the environment, and the environment was proxy by the number of trees, other trees in your plot. And we said, if you have a lot of trees, you have less cacao. So there is a trade-off between the quantity of money that you get from your production and the quantity of environment. Then we said, okay, uh, what's the relationship between the quantity that you produce and the number of other trees in your plot? We estimate that parameter from the regression. Uh, then we transform the parameter in a quantity. And then we said, okay, but what this quantity is worth in money term. We are dealing with money, okay? Despite all the discussion in this morning and despite that we believe that pluralistic approach is a good way to go, now we are looking into money. Everything has to be in monetary terms. So yesterday we said this, this quantity of uh, cacao, how much is worth it? And we said, okay, simply is the price of the cacao on the market. So we attach a price to a quantity. So in some ways, a pricing method, okay? This pricing method, um, we have been discussing in this day, that can have some implications. And the implications uh, are due to some failure of the market. So if in Indonesia, the government is subsidizing or is taxing or is doing other uh, regulation on the price of the cacao, or other factors, for example, the price that we attach is, is not the true market price, is a distortion of the market, okay? So market devaluation, the two methods, pricing and value, they both of them produce a number, and uh, this number can be used, this is something that we will see in the afternoon, so in the afternoon, uh, in some way we try to link all together, going back to the first cost-benefit analysis, when we try to estimate external values and we say how we estimate external value, a way of valuing the external value is pricing and valuation methods, okay? So uh, this valuation method that can complement a cost-benefit analysis is not the only place where we use valuation methods. So the price is the, as we said yesterday, the quick and dirty way to assign a price to a change in environmental uh, ecosystem services. The value has a different implication. Now to please Corrado, we do some, <laughs> a couple of graphs that are familiar to the economists. So, the price is coming from a market, okay? It's a point on the market. So this implies that I've got a demand function, I've got a supply function, and I've got a price. Now, all the time my student says, but where does demand and, and supply curves come from? It's true, we don't observe the, the curves normally. We have to do something to 
draw a demand curve or a supply curve, but we get from the market a price, okay? And we know that from economic theory, this is where the two curves meet up. The value, what's the value? The value is something else. The value is the willingness to pay. Is the willingness to pay of each of us. So it's the aggregate value that each of us assign to that good, to the snack that we got in that morning. So we say that is the area under this curve. So from a market setting, this is the welfare. So this is what would be the value, and that is the price. So there is a difference between price and value. Uh, so the pricing method is deriving one component of the demand curve. The, value, the valuation method derives the area under the curve. Now, going back to the exercise of yesterday, do we have a market, a demand to trade off? Because the, at the end of the day yesterday, we established a trade off between the quantity of cacao and the number of trees. Going back at, at the beginning of our lecture, we said, I swap five beans of cacao from, with uh, one rabbit. That was the trade-off, okay? So that's the same idea. Uh, exi does exist a market where you swap a kilo of cacao for one tree? Doesn't exist. So uh, for the majority of the ecosystem services, that's the problem. This demand curve doesn't exist. So everything that we will do in this morning is to try to estimate with some tricks the demand curve. As soon as we've got the demand curve, then we can estimate whatever we like. If there is a market, we can get a price, not necessary because normally we want a value. If there is not a market, we just estimate the area. And this area is what we call the first day uh, your utility, the social welfare, how happy we are as a society from getting, from receiving the ecosystem services or that good or service, okay? So there is this distinction of methodologies. In some books, they call pricing methods versus valuation methods. This morning, we just deal with the valuation methods, okay? So we want to derive a demand curve in different ways, and we derive this demand curve uh, to then associate the social welfare that comes from the demand curve. We have three families of methods that can be assigned under the valuation umbrella, okay? And these three methods, Kerry yesterday uh, mentioned briefly uh, some of this. Uh, they can be labeled as a reveal preference, state of preference, and benefit transfer. I believe no one, or at least no, the students from Uni Andes on the first day, he mentioned vaguely benef benefit transfer. I, we will look at the benefit transfer because despite is another quick and dirty approach, is very popular at the moment, okay? And we will see why it's popular. Reveal a preference, you see the picture yesterday, Kerry said, okay, the reveal preference, uh, there is not a market to swap a tree with a quantity of cacao. So what we can do? Well, we derive a quantity and then we look into the market for the price of cacao and here we go with a value. So in some way the market is suggesting the value for an ecosystem services, okay? Reveal preference. Set of preference is quite obvious. We have the uh, survey. Any stated preference method rely on a survey. Don't be confused because also reveal preference might require a survey, a questionnaire, okay? So it's not that when it's a survey, it's always stated preference. But the status preference is necessary a survey. The other one can or cannot be a survey, okay? Then before we move on, so the idea is to look generically how these three methods differ. Uh, but before we see how they differ, we have to remember what Kerry yesterday uh, show, and I'll be doing this, we have the value anyway in this part. The total economic value has been defined in this day. We have what we call use and non-use value. Then we have these different categories, the different categories, doesn't matter. What it does matter that the use value implies some 
direct or indirect use of the ecosystem services, so a strict, clear link between the human behaviors and the environment. The non-use value, a lot of discussion in this day, is something that, from an anthropocentric point of view, or the non-anthropocentric point of view, we assign a value to an ecosystem services, but for the existence, for the bequest value, so there is no revealed behavior about how we care about that ecosystem services. What does it mean? This means that if I want to get the total economic value of an ecosystem services, there is no way, we can see sometimes in the publication, that you can do with a reveal preference method. Okay, reveal preference method, they can just use, they can just derive use value. If you want to derive the uh, total economic value, you can use stated preference or benefit transfer. But benefit transfer just in some conditions, not all the time. And we will see which are the conditions. Uh, to be clear about this, the stated preference, that is, uh, again, something that we see uh, mainly in the dissertation of the students. Uh, People say, well, okay, I'm using a stated preference, so means immediately that I'm doing a total economic value. False is not true, okay? It depends how you set up the stated preference setting, you get the use value, the non-use value, or both of them. It's not that you use a method and automatically you get what you want to get, okay? So it's on the ends of the researcher to get the, uh, total economic value. It's not the methodology that provides the value per se. Um, before we move on and we see the uh, generic characteristics of the different methods, um, I want to ask you a question. And the question is this. I've been spending almost all my career doing uh, valuation with these methods. Can you guess why? Uh, someone already spot the problem. There is a lot of statistics, okay? So these methods, despite they're based on economics, so there is an economic theory, a structural economic theory behind these methods, but the economic theory is very simple. I want to derive a demand curve, full stop. There is nothing more than this. Yes, can be a bit more than that, but... <laughs> uh, However, they rely on a lot of statistics. And the statistics can come in two um, phases, okay? Yesterday we saw that the statistics came at the end. So basically the researcher went on the field, used a questionnaire. So you saw, yesterday we saw a survey results. So in that case, it's a production function, but there was a questionnaire. So you see, not necessarily a method is a survey production function, the, the, the researcher went on the field, interviewed many, many farmers, they got the responses, and yesterday together we saw the numbers, and we did some statistics, and we got our willingness to pay your monitor, monetary information, okay? So the statistics came at the end of this process. In some of the other, other methods, the statistics come right at the beginning. So the statistics plays a role how you define a survey as well as as you analyze the data. This is something to keep in mind. Okay, we are ready to see the generic characteristics. Um, reveal preference methods, if we have to give a name to these methods, uh, they are mainly travel cost, hedonic price, or hedonic wage. Uh, we will just focus on travel cost. Uh, given the time that we've got, I prefer, I decided, uh, we decided to focus on the travel cost this morning. Um, they are based on the market, so as we said, we observe a behavior of the humans on the market, and from the behavior on the market, we grasp the importance, we estimate with a statistical relationship, uh, the value of the ecosystem services. So just use value. Remember, it's not possible to use, to get the total economic value. Uh, what is necessary and what we have to do, we have to establish if the behavior on the market uh, change according to the change of the quality 
or quantity of the environment or the ecosystem service that we are valuing. Just to anticipate the example. Uh, we observe the number of visits to a national park. Okay, so uh, I go to that national park 100 times in 12 months. Okay, then that national park now is popular, there is a fire. So the quality of the park is going to decrease because half of the park is now burned down. I still go 100 times per year to visit the park. This is a problem because if my behavior on the market does not reflect the environmental quality of the environment, I cannot use travel cost, okay? So there is this uh, implicit assumption that my behavior on the market reflects the quality of the quantity of the environmental services. It's an assumption, but you see this. You, you, you should be able to see this in your data. Um, so the market is a proxy for the environmental quality. Uh, we get the results using primary data, so we have to do a survey, or using secondary data. We, we will see later on travel cost. We can perform a travel cost analysis using data already available, so we don't need to go and talk to the visitors of the national park to get their behavior. We might have access data already available and we can do our travel cost analysis. However, I have to say that the majority of the time or the, the most standard uh, travel cost method rely on uh, questionnaire. So we set up a questionnaire, we go in the park or we go and collect the data about the behavior of the respondents. Edonic price or edonic wage is different. They mainly rely on secondary data. So it depends where uh, we are. I have to anticipate, for example, at the end of this uh, travel cost session, I will present an example that is coming from, I'm afraid, UK again. Uh, but in that case, we have a travel cost analysis that is based on secondary data. Why is based on secondary data? Because the government, the UK government, is a crazy government about the environment. So they have been collected for six years now, travel cost data and they, uh, this is an environmental agency uh, that is collecting this data. The data are freely available, so any researcher, you, can download the data and play with the data. So in this case, you can do travel cost and very elaborated travel cost analysis with secondary data. It's quite unusual, but it's a possibility. Um, the value that I'm deriving at the end of this exercise how robust can I believe, can I do a policy about this value? The answer is depends on the econometrics analysis. So depends exactly on what we did yesterday, okay? So it doesn't matter in some way where and how you get the data. Okay, if you, if you develop a questionnaire that is really terrible, it might have an implication of what you get at the end, but normally the questionnaire is quite standard, so it's, it's rare that you, um, mix up the, the results. What is instead is very important is the assumption that you have to make to get the values, so the econometric analysis. Um, it can be used for some environmental policy. We will see later on an example. So it can be used in policy decision making when you have a change in quality of quantity of an ecosystem services. Normally, it requires between two and six months, so it's not a quick and dirty application. We will do this in one hour later on, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll contradict myself straight away. Um, of course, the two six months is on average, okay? So consider it from the most advanced to the simplest one. The simplest one that we will see together in one hour today is really quick, okay? It's dirty and it's quick. Uh, other problem, two six months imply on average between one and 30,000 pounds for doing the studies. Again, this is on a broad scale, okay? So you can do travel cost with less than a thousand, but these valuation methods, all of them, apart from the benefit transfer, has some trade-off as usual. So sometimes, uh, especially the policy makers, they have to make the decision, it's worth it to spend public money to increase my knowledge on the value of the ecosystem services or it's better for me to save that public money to do something else, okay? So there is a trade-off between the information that you get and the money and time that you have to wait and spend. These are the revealed preference. Uh, stated preference, we need a survey. There is nothing that you can do about this. 
someone has to develop a questionnaire. Uh, the two methods under the family of state of preference is contingent valuation and choice modeling. I know one of the first days some of you mentioned conjoint. I will explain later on why the name is choice modeling, but we are talking about the same business. So uh, in this case, if you want, and just if you want, the researcher can get the total economic value. But because you are in charge of designing the questionnaire, it depends how you design the questionnaire. The questionnaire is not self-form, okay? So how you frame it and what you get it. Uh, in this case, um, the preferences are based on a contingent scenario, okay? Let's make the example related to the yesterday application. The example is this. I'm producing cocoa with my trees. Uh, however, I know there is a trade-off between the other trees that I've got in my plot and the cacao tree. Uh, if I can establish, and this is what the governments are doing, a payment for ecosystem, a market for the payment for ecosystem services, so I can swap my quantity of cacao for a for a number of trees, in some way is a, is a market, but it's a contingent market, okay? It's a fake market, it's established by the uh, participants, the institutions in, the, in that market. This is what you have to do with a stated preference. So you have to set up a market where, hypothetically, in few cases, people have later on established a real market where there was a swap, but in principle, you establish a market and you ask to, so, we do exactly the same surveys have as the Indonesian colleagues, but now you go and ask, um, how much are you willing to receive as a compensation to maintain one tree in your plot? So now we don't want to know the relationship between the price and the quantity. We ask the farmers, how much are you willing to give away? What's your opportunity cost? of having an extra tree. So now we don't, we don't assign a price, we ask them to reveal their preferences, okay? So that's the kind of contingent setting that you can set up in a choice experiment. You have to do it, that's the point, okay? So it's up to the uh, respondent, the questionnaire. So the questionnaire has to be designed carefully to make sure that later on the results comply with the expectation. Uh, so the survey design is a key element. And in the survey design, we will see later on, especially when we do choice modeling, there is quite a bit of statistics, okay? And the quite bit of statistics is not on uh, the sampling, because when we do a survey, we saw in the first course of statistics that you have to deal with sample size and uh, sampling techniques. It's not just about this, it's a bit more than that, okay? So this implication with statistical design of your questionnaires and also the sample. Uh, from the respondent point of view, it's quite an intense activity because you ask them, from the farmers, you ask them how much are you willing to receive as a compensation to reduce your production of cacao to have an extra tree. It's quite a challenging task, okay? Because we are dealing, it can be easy because the clever farmers is thinking about how much is, uh, is uh, losing in terms of quantity. You make a quick calculation and say exactly what we established yesterday. But some, some others can assign a different value to what they do, so they might estimate differently. And the example of yesterday is quite simple. When we deal, uh, again, the students that Jose is not here today, that he was presenting the valuation of the biodiversity. How much are you willing to pay to maintain the biodiversity? And you have to estimate, to express a value. It's quite a challenging task, okay? So it's cognitive intense. What does it mean? It means, again, that what the uh, research, of, well, the, the students from Uniandens uh, presented us, this behavioral, uh, aspect is quite important. So we, we should, we, it's, it's good if we can keep in mind that we react differently uh, to different uh, settings, okay? So if we can minimize our uh, nonsense in how we present the survey, this is a strength, okay? So we can get this insight from other disciplines. Psychology, for example, is another discipline quite important. It can help to design 
a questionnaire for choice uh, modeling and quantitative evaluation. Um, there is econometrics also to minimize the bias from how you design the questionnaire. So again, a lot of statistics. This is the fun for me. And then um, the econometrics later on, we can say that it is not as difficult as the statistics of the reveal preference for some technicalities that is not relevant, but there is a bit of statistics also to estimate the results, okay? So if we want to rate from one to 10 the difficulties in statistics of stated preference, reveal preference, this is scoring nine. The uh, reveal preference is scoring six, okay? So this is the most intense in terms of statistics. Um, of course, this cost in uh, learning curves in the statistics that you have to learn uh, is coming with uh, a price. And the price is that you can study not just the total economic value, but you can study whatever you wish. So current and future environmental changes in quality, in quantity, in whatever you like. Why is this? Because you design the market. You design the contingent scenario. As long as the scenario is well done, you can estimate everything, okay? For the park, uh, there is not much that I can do. I go to that park, the park had that characteristics, full stop. So if I want to see if I travel more, I'm going 100 times to Chingaza, uh, I would go 200 times to Chingaza if Chingaza had more uh, infrastructure for uh, bird watching. It's impossible because there is no market, so you cannot observe my behavior on the market full stop, okay? So you cannot use reveal preference for this kind of setting. So uh, with the contingent evaluation of choice experiment is the opposite. You set the scenario and then you ask me how much more would you go or would you change your behavior? So this is the flexibility. Uh, flexibility is coming with such a bit of intense <laughs> activity in designing a choice experiment. Again, on average, because there are state of preference surveys that they run for longer than that, some of them can be quicker than that, but it's not a quick exercise. And I don't know, mm, I want to be clear, none of you, or if you, <laughs> if you succeed, let me know, none of you should be able, or if he's able, is great, to be able to develop a, a valuation methods by the end of this day, okay? It requires some learning activities. Uh, so if you go instead and read some other papers of people that have done a choice experiment or a reveal preference, and you spot that they've done a survey uh, from the beginning to the end in one month, start to look into the details, okay? It's a bit dodgy. If you have done in a month, it means that you don't know exactly what you are doing. So this is a rule of thumb, okay? When you read this kind of studies, keep in mind this top line information. They require such a, a bit of thinking. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of flexibility, also a lot of cost. I will show you later on that uh, we have the top end of this, it can be astronomical. We have an example later on um, from US, is usually that they spend more than a million dollars for a continuous evaluation study. So it can be very, very costly to do a survey with all the guidelines uh, on hand. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that it's given a lot of information, but it requires some, a bit of uh, investment. It can be cheaper than that, because this estimates is considering, uh, let's say, old-fashioned way of collecting the data. Nowadays, it's getting more and more cheaper to get this, uh, cheaper and cheaper to get this, because uh, we can access online survey app to do the survey, so the data collection costs are coming down. So it can be quite cheap, but still you need to think about what you do. Okay, so, so far it's clear that reveal preference, set of preference, they are not so quick and dirty as we would like, so they require some investment. So an obvious uh, solution, we are economists, is to try to avoid all of this. And so over the time, and we will see this this morning, there is this new method that is called benefit transfer. And the benefit transfer provides some advantages because uh, what it does is you don't develop any studies yourself, so you don't do any reveal of stated preference. You just look at what others have done. If you remember the presentation again of Uniandes, he said we look at the 
uh, valuation studies across the globe that are dealing with coastal and marine ecosystem services. So they didn't develop any questionnaire. They just look at their results. So what does it mean? That in some way, if a lot of people before you have already done choice modeling on continent valuation on the coastal ecosystem services that you try to value, okay, is, is a second best, but you, it's better for you to get the number, have a sense of the value, than if that value think, well, it really doesn't fit my case study. I want to do a better tailored study for my area, go and do it, but otherwise, it's better off to save money and time and use someone else's results. It can determine use and non-use value. Yes, because if someone before you has designed, say the preference uh, questionnaire that were capturing total economic value, you can estimate a total economic value. So it depends on the others. This is copy and paste, okay? If someone before you has done this, then you can paste the same value. So in some ways, quite flexible. Um, the quality of your results depends on the quality of the researcher before you, so that's the challenge. We have to trust the numbers that the others have produced. This is the challenges bit, because uh, nowadays you get a lot of stuff uh, available, and what we know that if we put garbage in the valuation, we get garbage out. So if you select a bunch of studies that are not good, you are getting bad results. By definition, there is no uh, option on this, okay? So there is this challenge of be able to select the studies. It's a very common, very common, more than we know among the agency. So the World Bank, um, many other institutes, uh, governments are using benefit transfer quite frequently, okay? So it's a very common methodology. It can be developed in few days, in few weeks. So the trade-off with the with the other methods is quite uh, attractive. Uh, a can cost zero if you can have access to available databases, and nowadays the number of databases is increasing. Or it can cost about 5,000 pounds if you have to access the credit uh, and to download data already available from others. Um, so it's quite an attractive approach, okay? We will see the detail. Um, my, uh, and well, something else to say, we have been looking in these days about the um, ecological economist, astronomical figures about the value of ecosystem services and natural capital, Costanza, to give a name again. And in the paper 1997 and in the paper 2014, 17, and all this, the paper that he has produced, he always used benefit transfer, okay? However, again, as a non-economist, it doesn't get exactly this idea of garbage in, garbage out. So it gets a value, attach the value, and that's the value. So for example, in the 1997 paper, he produced the total figure of the GDP equivalent of ecosystem services, and what he does, he value grassland across the globe using one single study coming from Minnesota in the US. Do you believe the grassland in Colombia is the same as grassland in Minnesota and has the same value of grassland in Europe? I don't, but I'm not a, <laughs> a biologist or ecologist. Um, but this is what he does, okay? So he gets some values, he multiplies everything, and he gets the figure. So is well spread as a methodology to value ecosystem services, more than we realize. Okay, we have set the scene, now we focus on revealed preference uh, data. Questions? Yes, please. Um, there is a... Um, ah, yes. Yes, there is a microphone. Uh, yes, thank you. kills your cow yes. he will probably condition his response based that that it's me who is asking how
this is the, the strength of the statistician, because the statisticians are aware of these biases. So what you have to make sure is this error that is coming from biases is average out, okay? It's not systematic. So you have someone that is overestimating because they have a lot of experience with Jaguar, someone else that is underestimating because they've never seen a Jaguar, and, and so on and so forth. If Statistically speaking, you do a good job in this sense, you can say that the effect of the bias is cancelled out. Okay, so there's a lot of statistical, magical, uh, chemical composition of the sample that you have to do. It's not always so easy and perfect, because to do perfect statistical job, um, sometimes you need to spend a lot of money, and money are not always available, so you might have a degree of error from this point of view. Uh, have you or have people tried like other methods that doesn't require like just face-to-face -face contact like for example ah, no, filling no. Yes, uh, yes. Ah, forms sorry. or sorry i didn't get your question then sorry i apologize no, i thought you were asking no 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 they not all this time you do a face-to-face -face. yes there are millions of methods that you can use to avoid this i see what you are the interviewer bias yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay yes yes there are several methods, and I do agree, there is an interviewer bias. Just to tell you, as Kerry was doing yesterday, a little story. We did a survey in Italy um, about the waste management, so it was a quite easy task. Uh, but the easy task was not so easy when we look into the interviewer bias, because there were, uh, the number of interviewers were balanced between males and females, but there were a couple of interviewers, one male and one female, that were behaving completely different from the others. So it was clear that there was a bias of the interviewers. So because you know this, you have to be clever, because if you, for example, uh, you know that there is an interviewer bias, okay? So you have all males or all females is already a mistake. So you have a balance and then the same interviewer, I know, that, I know that for survey cost, you want to send the interviewer in one zone of the city and do all the survey. But ideally, the same interviewer has to go in different places because then the error that is coming from in that interviewer is averaged out from the zone of the city. So these are all the kind of statistically thinking that you can have to minimize these biases. And there are different methods that you can use. Yes, nowadays you have online stuff, you have app, you have paper version, send by post, uh, telephone interview, and so on and so forth. Yes. Any questions? Yep. Okay. Um, tenía una pregunta muy similar a la del compañero. Eh, no sé cómo funciona en Europa, pero aquí en Colombia muchas veces al preguntarle a los campesinos mienten por el miedo a que uno sea alguien del gobierno y les pueda quitar los subsidios, ¿sí? Entonces tal vez estos métodos basados en encuesta, no sé si ya los hayan probado su efectividad, no sé, por ejemplo, comparando granjeros en Europa, campesinos acá, ¿quién realmente está, bueno, qué tan efectivo es el método acá, qué tan efectivo es el método allá? Y bueno, un poco también cómo so pesar esas mentiras que nos dicen en campo. Definitely a great question. Uh, yes, indeed there is this uh, possibility that there is a cultural effect and uh, um, there is recently a paper, um, not quite recently, in the last five years, that is looking into how state preference approaches different in developed and in developing countries. Um, Again, you can design your survey to minimize this error. What does it mean, though? That you have to know the culture, you have to talk with the people, you have to set up your scenario to accommodate the different culture. What does it mean? If you get my questionnaire from Europe, just come and apply to Colombia straight away, Yes, you can see such a bit of bias. We have done survey in uh, Malawi recently. There is a paper that Jaime is aware of. And we were dealing with, uh, let's say, smart agriculture adaptation strategy, crops. Uh, Malawi is one of the poorest country in uh, Africa. And we were in uh, the Zomba district, that is in the uh, north part of the country, where, let's say, 50% of the sample cannot read and write. Okay, um, but there were 
able to understand what we were talking about, but there were months and months and months and months of preparation of the questionnaire. That's why the time can be quite long, because it's not that and the same, no, the same, a similar survey was developed for Europe, and we have collected similar responses in Europe, but we couldn't just get one questionnaire and apply it in the other place. So there is all this, uh, I can say that uh, people that are skeptical about economies because you just produce a value. Yes, we produce a value, but if you produce a value with some sense, this deliberative, uh, multi-pluralistic uh, approach is built into the questionnaire. So the questionnaire gives a number that reflects this pluralistic community's approach. Again, it depends on you. Not on the method per se. The method gives you the, the recipe, then how you do the, the cake, is up to you. So, but yes, indeed, is uh, something to be aware of. Quería complementar un poquito tu pregunta. ¿Cómo lo hemos hecho nosotros en casos en los que hemos aplicado temas parecidos? Eh, y son, digamos, tres tres lecciones que a nosotros nos ha funcionado. Una eh, no contratar encuestadores profesionales, eh, ni no profesionales tampoco, preferiblemente gente de la misma comunidad que ya haya construido una confianza y que no se sientan vulnerados en el sentido de cuando están llegando eh, que te están atacando con preguntas, sino que sea un tema mucho más eh, dinámico de alguna forma en la cual uno pueda realmente sustraer lo que quiere averiguar sin que sea un método directamente, digamos, como de encuesta. Y una lectura del territorio supremamente previa al diseño de la encuesta es, es muy clave eh, para poder entender al actor al cual uno se va, se va a encontrar. Si uno logra eso, creo que el resultado del método puede funcionar mejor, que está, creo que, eh, no necesariamente implícito en, en, en la valoración per se, eh, sino como el conocimiento más del territorio. Pero eso sucede muchísimo. Eh, y también eh, uno incluye algunas preguntas para poder comprobar eh, efectivamente si lo que están revelando, como, como cascaritas, que al final estadísticamente uno puede corregir después si sí o no, eh, lo mismo cuando le hacen uno, digamos, como las encuestas de, sí, de polígrafo o de, o de temas de empleo y demás, la psicología ya tiene diseñada cuando está diciendo una mentira o no, y a complementar eso. Thank you. Yes, indeed, is, uh, I fully agree on this, yes. Not all the time is the case, that's the point. So uh, not all the time people are aware of this. So you go and do a survey, is a survey, what's the problem? Uh, is a problem, okay? And this is mainly coming, sorry again, <laughs> I have to blame the lack of multidisciplinarity, where non-economists, they say, well, I can write a questionnaire, I'm going to do it by myself, we can clearly see this. Economists per se, when they design a questionnaire without psychological or community background, they can also do the same. So if we want to do a good job, we have to admit our limits and to get a support from the others. So it's quite easy, if you, know under, if you know few things, you go through the literature, you see what has been produced, for example, and you say, this is not an economist, this is just an economist, this is an economist and a psychologist, blah, blah, blah. You can clearly see what is going on from the setting of the questionnaire, okay? So, uh, okay, is that? <laughs> but the results that you are getting are very, very informative for policy decision makers, for the community themselves. So it's intense, uh, it's, it's a, it's a there is a learning curve, uh, but it's rewarding. So as, we, as usual, is, there is a trade-off. Interview is from the same community, might not be a good idea. So we had, Again, a, depends. we did a survey on sexual habits in Italy, in Southern Italy, and uh, you, you're not going to tell your neighbor that you're gay. It's not going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So in Italy, there are no gays, <laughs> officially, right? So it's... No, but it, it, the question is, it needs to be tailored on case by case. I suppose in some community in Colombia, you want to use enumerators from the community. What you have to do to make sure that this bias is not happening, that you train the members of the community, because otherwise, the members of the community, they have their own belief, okay, about what you are going to do. So they go there and say, would you accept one, three for reducing the cacao 
And the answer is yes, okay? Because there is this. So they have to know that you go there and say, what you say, I trust, okay? So there is this possibility of uh, bias. It's an intense activity to do all of this. So it's the design of this service is, is intense from this point of view. Okay, uh, <clears throat> however, now we move on travel costs. So reveal preference data are a bit more, well, a bit simpler because we don't ask a contingent behavior. Now we have just to ask what you do. And from what you do, I can draw some information about what you value, okay? And we have three major uh, methods under the umbrella of, this, of the travel cost methodology, okay? The three <coughs> methods, they move in terms of uh, complexity. So the zonal travel cost is, uh, is the oldest travel cost approach, is the quickest, and is the one that we will do together as an exercise later on. Uh, <coughs> why is so simple? Because it just requires aggregate information about number of visitors to a specific recreational area, full stop. The second one, the single site travel cost, uh, is a bit more elaborated because now we don't deal with the aggregate behavior of people visiting a national park, but we want to go down to the individual level, how the different individuals of the community are recreating in the park. So you can grasp immediately that for the second uh, exercise, I need a sort of questionnaire, because for each of the visitors, I need to get some information, who you are, where you come from, are you a bird watcher, are you fishing, and so on and so forth, okay? These two methods, as you see, they are in the same side. They share uh, uh, characteristics. You just focus on one specific area, a river, and I look aggregately how the people interact with the river, the same river, and I see how people uh, individually interact with the river. Uh, just to see where Norwich is, this is Norwich, this is Cambridge, and this is London. So uh, again, it's an example from UK, a map from UK. The difference instead between the first two and the last one, the one that I call the multi-site travel cost, with the first two, you have one site. You focus on your attention on that site, and that's it. So you ask about the behavior that people reveal on the market about going to Chingaza, okay, this is our example today. <clears throat> However, Chingaza is not the only option that I've got if I want to do bird watching in Colombia. So if I just focus on Chingaza, I might over or underestimate the um, beauty or the attraction that other uh, natural areas can offer to bird watchers. So to do a job that the uh, economists can support a bit more, you want to take into the consideration of what we call complements and substitutes. What are the complements and substitutes? Is that Ching uh, when I'm, I'm in Bogota today, I may help me because I don't know <laughs> the substitute now. I'm in Bogota today. I have to decide where to go for bird watching. So in my mind, I've got Datama, Shingaza, and other three or four parks in Bogota. Okay, in my mind, so now I've got multiple sites, okay? And each of these sites, they all provide me uh, the opportunity to see the birds, but also they offer me some other attraction. I don't know, I have the ice cream in one, but not in the other, the simplest one. Then I've got dif distances. For one, I have to take a flight. Then I have to take a car and then a boat. This is Tatama. I'm getting better in Colombia <laughs> transport mode. Uh, I go to Chingaza, just get a car. It takes a couple of hours. So I, 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 have, I can consider all these opportunities when I model my behavior towards the environment. Okay? So the last method clearly is the most advanced. It's the one that gives me a full picture of my interaction with natural parks is a bit more complicated because now I need to do two things. I need to, again, talk at the individual level, where do you go? And then for each of the parks, I need to understand what they have to offer. So now I have to, in some way, survey the individuals and survey the parks, okay? So this is the most intense one in terms of data. And because it's the most intense one, is the, also the more informative and 
complex and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we start with the simple one. But before we start, where the travel cost come from? The travel cost is coming from a long time ago. When in the US, we were, well, they, were, they started before us to deal with this idea, how do I manage a public space as a natural park, and I persuade my government to give me money because this is a free resource. People are enjoying it, but then I go to the, nation, to the government, I say I need one more billion to improve, I don't know, the connectivity or to restore a wetland or to do such and such. How can I do this? Because there is not an evident market for the benefits that people are trying, are getting from this. Uh, so the intuition of this, uh, researcher or telling, he wrote a letter and he said, what we have to do is just to observe how many people are coming to the park every year because the number of visitors is the intensity of the importance of the park. Simple like this. Um, and when they decide to come to the park, they make an opportunity cost. We have been talking about the opportunity cost all these days. So when I decide to go to the park, I first of all go to Tatama, it takes two hours by a car, so my car needs fuel, my car needs a maintenance cost, needs an insurer, and so on and so forth, so there is a cost. So I'm spending money, and if I'm spending money expecting that it's gonna be an awful day off, I must be crazy, okay? So I'm spending money because I'm expecting that, see, one bird is rewarding and is covered the cost of traveling to Tatama. That's the intuition, okay? So again, is this market reveal information. I might have other uh, elements in my mind, uh, but this is the minimum, lower bound that we can do with the economics. Uh, I also have the opportunity cost to do something else. So I can go shopping and get the beautiful shoes in Bogota. So why should I? waste four hours or 10 hours or whatever it takes to go to bird watching that I can go do something else. I can do it because they, uh, I forgive my enjoyment on buying shoes or shopping because I expect to get something better in, in, the, in, the, in the national park, okay? So there is all this travel cost, travel time, so all these components reveal the importance of the park. And in some way, you can think, well, actually, make some sort of sense. Uh, of course, it's a lower bound. You can get more than this. So you, you, you cannot say, oh, this is the total value of my park. No, no, this is just the value that you capture observing the market. So your, your national park have an immense bigger <laughs> value because it's, I don't know, protecting endangered species, but it might not be captured by the travel cost method because the existence of that species is not captured in the travel cost method, so it's a lower bound. Uh, only use, we said that. Uh, so few assumptions from the economic point of view. We already said this, so briefly, uh, there is this idea um, the link between the market and uh, so cost, time, and their, their equivalent in terms of cost is the proxy of the importance of the ecosystem services and the recreational experience. Um, some implication, I said that going to Tatama, but going to Tatama is different than going to Chingaza because to go to Tatama is quite unlikely that I can go daily because by the time they get there and back, it's a bit longer. So if I compare these two parks in the same ground, it's a bit unfair. And not only this, let's suppose now going in somewhere else in Colombia, in Leticia, is, is exactly, and I'm visiting the park while I'm going to a business meeting. So my cost to go to Leticia and visit that park can all be assigned to the park, or in some way, maybe not, because I was there for other business, and then I visited the site. So the idea of assigning the cost of traveling to a park, we have to be careful, because that cost needs to be assigned only to the park. Because if I go to Chingaza, because next door there is my granny, this is a bit of inflation of the value, okay? So there is a lot of uh, assumption, or the idea that you, I compare a uh, visit of one day with a visit of one day. I compare it visit of two days with a visit of two days. I need to make sure that the travel costs just focus on the travel for the national parks and not business 
uh, activities. This is all the information that I can gather from uh, a questionnaire, of course. But you have to ask for this question again. You have to be aware of this. Um, the zonal travel cost, of course, is, uh, is very simple. It requires minimal assumption, but of course, is, uh, the, the quality of the information is also minimal. Um, Multi-sites, as we said, we need to survey the respondent and we need to survey the parks, the characteristic of the site. Uh, and we have to set different information together. This is uh, already covered, we stress again, there is a bit of terminology, this weak complementarity assumption that the economist would define. It's simple like, there is this link between your behavior on the market and your importance of the sites. As we said, I'm going to the park and I'm going 100 times, there is a fire, the quality is reduced, I'm going 80 times. So there is, I reduce my travel because the quality is going down. They are complementary, they go together, okay? One goes up, the other goes down. So there is this complementarity that is the basic assumption behind travel cost. We are ready to go. So now we can do the zonal travel cost together. How we do the travel cost? I'll give you the recipe in the theory, and then later on, with Corrado, we do the application, okay? So what's the idea? The idea is what we said. I, okay, I've got a park, it's my dot in that example there. Uh, let's suppose the manager of the park is quite organized. So what he does, <coughs> He register the number of visitors from different zip codes of the, of the visitors, okay? It's a simple question. So you go to the park and you have to say, I'm coming from Bogota, I'm coming from Cali, and so on and so forth. So there is a register. So the manager of the park uh, do know that there are a total number of visitors and they come from the different zone. That's the different zone, okay? It's a proportion. So what I need to do then, uh, I for each of these zones in a very rough way, okay? Because coming from Bogota, I do learn that Bogota is quite a stance. So if I live in one side of Bogota, it can take two hours and a half to go to Chingaza. If I'm living in the other side, I can take one hour and a half. But I'm dealing with aggregate data. So I cannot be so fussy about the precise distance. So what I can do, I can say roughly, if you come from Bogota, this is the cost, okay? So I can assign for each zone an average cost for traveling. Sounds simple. Then what I can do, uh, I can consider the value of time. This is a question. How do we value the time now? This is a controversial element of travel cost. Why is controversial? Because it's the opportunity cost of our time. What is the opportunity cost of our time? And uh, uh, there is not an answer. Uh, in, on, if you look at the literature about recreational uh, models, what they do, they use some, again, approximation. And the approximation is, is a percentage of my salary. And what about retired people? And what about students? They don't have an opportunity cost of time? It might be wrong, okay? so. Again, we have to make some assumption, or sometimes, that's what we will do later on, you can say that the, travel, the opportunity cost of travel time is zero, okay? Uh, if we look into, uh, later on in the literature, there are some rule of thumbs, okay? So we say three quarter of the average income is the travel cost, is the opportunity cost of travel time. This is an assumption. You might, uh, well, I might have to, uh, press, to uh, stress that, um, the economists, sometimes they put a lot of uh, justification and say, oh, we make this assumption, we made the other assumption, so people get the idea, oh, this is all bullshit, there's a lot of assumption, okay? Uh, <laughs> no, the other, the other, in the other discipline, you do the same. You do exactly the same. In every discipline, we work in a simplified setting. Is it not possible to control for everything? Don't persuade me that when Andreas is going to do an inventory, he counts every single three in a preci precise way. This is not true. He's doing a sampling mechanism and then he tries to say, in this plot, this is what is coming on. There is a, a statistical assumption that you have to make in order to pro progress. So in all disciplines, we work with assumption, okay? So we are not worse than any other. We have our worst, <laughs> but we are not worse, okay? Um, 
what we have to do now, so we have the total number of visits per zone, uh, we have the cost because we have an average uh, travel cost by zone. Then we can easily say, okay, from Bogota, I've got two million visitors in Chingaza per year. Okay, how many people are living in, uh, in Bogota? 11 million. So what's the rate of uh, visitation? So how many people from Bogota as a percentage are coming to Chingaza? It's just a proportion of the number of visitors over the number of population. So I get a, a rate of visitation. What we expect from an economic point of view, that the number of visits, guess what? Has to go down when you go far away from the place. So far away you are, less you visit, because if you visit at the same time, the travel cost is, no, is not your method anymore, okay? Means that something is not functioning, because the, the distance should reflect your opportunity cost to value, and so there is this implication. At the individual level, you can observe uh, more heterogeneity, so I can live in Cali and go to Chingaza the same number of time of Jaime living in Bogota, but when you see why, I'm a professional bird watcher, Jaime has to work fully intensely on the Grow Colombia project, so of course I go more, I spend more, but I'm a professional bird watcher. So at the individual level I can do this, <laughs> uh, well I'm going for my job <laughs> to bird watching. <laughs> so, this is, in, again, an assumption that we have to make, but make a, so, a sort of sense. And at the aggregate level, of course, is uh, what we have to make. So now we have the key ingredients to create a function. What function? Uh, our dream, the demand function, because now I can establish a relationship between the visitation rate and the travel cost. So I've got this point information, very aggregate, very rough, and I can design a curve. And this curve is a demand curve. And from the demand curve, I can grasp some business in terms of welfare losses. So let's suppose I'm now the manager of the National Park of Chingaza, and I want to see if I'm charging a bit more Supposing that there is a, a parking fee in Chingaza, I want to increase the cost of parking in Chingaza. What's the loss that I'm imposing on the society in doing this change? Okay? So this is not a change about the setting of my uh, site, but is a setting of the management of the site. This is a limitation of the methods because I cannot see the differences in, uh, in the quality of the site. To do this, I need to have a multi-site travel cost methods. Okay, so I can use the results for policy decision making. So you see from this example, I might use a revealed, uh, travel cost application not to complement a cost benefit analysis. I'm using a revealed, uh, a revealed preference results to answer a specific question. How much should I charge as I increase in the no, <laughs> to, to manage the park. It can be a cost-benefit analysis. So the idea is that the evaluation methods can be a standalone uh, methodology to answer research question, or it can be a methodology that complements cost-benefit analysis, for example, okay? It depends on what you have to do. So in, uh, in a nutshell, what is the travel cost? The travel cost is simple, is very uh, cheap. Uh, it just really on aggregate analysis, so even the regression analysis is very simple, you have few points, you have just to clusterize the respondents. Uh, of course, ignore the diversity of the respondents, so it cannot capture that I'm a bird watcher professional one, and Jaime is doing something else. Uh, it can be used, I claim, for a sort of awareness of management, okay? So I'm thinking about changing something, how much is, the disappointment that I can create, how many people can be upset about this management, I get a sort of figures, okay? Then if I want to do a better job, maybe I want to go and do a proper survey, but let's suppose I have to do a quick uh, feedback to the auditor of my park, I can use the travel cost. Um, 
of course, can be problematic, especially in the remote area. Why can be problematic? Because you don't have access to the number of visitors. So this information about the number of visitors is not already available, and there is no sense to spend a lot of time to just get the number of visitors. If you have to collect information like this, ask specific questions, and you do a single site travel cost. And plus, there are places where you don't have an entrance point. So why do you capture this visitor? We don't know, so this can be a limit, okay? This will be our exercise. Yes. Uh, I'm there he is. Could you use the travel method uh, to evaluate? Uh, not like, for example, it's very obvious when it's a service, like eco um, uh, ecotourism, uh, ecotourism is a service, but as an opportunity cost, like, for example, you have an area where you want to convince landowners not to deforest because it can potentially be uh, like an ecotourism place. So could you, for example, evaluate similar places that have ecotourism and extrapolate that? Yes, to, okay. that is benefit transfer, though. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. But yes. Yeah. Yes, of course you can do it. And in principle, before I said, you cannot value the characteristics of the site. No? For example, Chingaza, you have the bear. In another park, you have something else. So you don't, you don't value the uh, offer of ecosystem services of the park. But if you can see similarities of the population, but differences in the um, characteristics of the site, then you can see, oh, there is a difference. And this difference is due to not the population, but it's due to by the characteristics of the site. It's very rough as information, so you need a multi-site to do a, a good job, but mm -hmm. absolutely it's doable, so yes. So, zonal, sorry. Okay, the zonal travel cost, we said before, we move on the single site. I know that I'm running quite slow. Uh, ninth? Ah, okay. It's not too terrible. Uh, the single site. So we said the single site, we are still focusing on one single place. It's still the Shingaza Garden uh, or Park. <laughs> but now I'm not happy about just looking at the proportion of people that are visiting from Bogota. And I want to see who is coming from Bogota, OK? Who, who, who are they? What they do? What's their income level? What the level of education and so on and so forth? And plus, I want to know what they do with my park. So now I have to develop a questionnaire. Uh, normally what we do, we focus especially in the number of visits that people are doing to a specific site in what we call a season. What is a season? Independent depends on the natural resource. In some places you have just, I don't know, summer, you have just winter, you have the 12 months. This is very case by case, but you have to focus the horizon of your study, because otherwise, this is another problem. You, someone said, I come 10 times per month. The other respondent said, I come 100 times per year. The other one said, I come 1,000 times for 10 years. So you have to be uh, clear on the horizon when you ask your questions. Uh, what you want to know, the number of times that that respondent went to the park in the last 12 or many months that you've got in your uh, interpretation. You have to, again, to consider a cost of traveling. Now the cost of traveling, is it the individual cost of traveling? So now there is a bit more analysis because now you have to get for every single respondent a cost. It can sound simple, okay? It can be controversial because people try to... Um, reveal the cost in different ways. So a standard way to do this, you ask the people, where do you come from? Uh, and then you, nowadays it's easier in GIS, you assign a, a objective distance and objective cost. Because people can say, oh yes, it was about $50, uh, okay? But what is this $50? There, there are studies where people compare the, the report, the self-reported distances with the measured distance. Normally, nowadays, is the measured distance. Um, so we do exactly as before. Now we have, rather than the visitation rate, now we have the number of visits to that site as a function of what? The same things as before. We have the travel cost that we have to 
uh, calculate. And then we have, now we can have more information than before because now we, we don't have the aggregate information. We can start controlling for other variables. What are the other variables? What we said. Your profession, your age, your income, you develop a service so you can ask all of this. Yes, Orlando. Uh, hi, may I have you go? Let's do like this. <laughs> it's easier. Thank you. Uh, I have a question there in the control variables. Yes. Uh, usually, in most of the standard models of our single site, they use income. But sometimes that's a really difficult question to ask to the people, and it creates a lot of noise because it's so difficult to people to express the, they don't want to express their real income. So I wonder if there is a way that we can avoid that as a control variable or what are the costs or the trade-off to avoid it? Uh, bueno, puedo responder en español. Uh, <laughs> no, please in English, oh, so I can. Okay. <laughs> well. So, so, so it, is, it is indeed a very difficult question to ask uh, uh, in surveys, and I think most of the surveys in Colombia have proven that asking directly for income does not work, or it's not reliable. Um, so the alternative strategies that are used are, for example, um, uh, asking for ranges of income, which is less invasive than asking directly but for income. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, sorry, uh, well, I have to specify when I said income uh, for uh, um, privacy, you never ask the precise income, okay? You always ask a range. This is for clarity. We never, even in Europe, ask how much is your own specific income. We give brackets, and you have to say in this bracket, in that bracket. I see the issues of people, for example, in uh, UK, people are quite all right, I would say. Uh, in Italy, they lie about the income, so they're all very poor, okay? So we know this, <laughs> very easy. Uh, so our solution is to fr try and find, so there are different solutions. One, you can create some sort of proxy of the income. So for example, we in the past, we did a survey with the, um, people going hunting on fishing, okay? So then I asked them, how, ma how many times are you coming this place, uh, this time? Uh, and then how much do you spend per year for, I don't know, the net, the whatever you need, the equipment for go fishing? If someone said they're spending, I don't know, uh, 10,000 euros to go fishing, and then they say that the income level is the, at the bottom of the scale, something going on, okay? So in that case, you don't have the income as, a number, but you can create classes, I suppose is what he was saying. So you have bottom, middle, uh, and top, okay? So you don't have the income. The problem of, of not reporting the income is the problem with Corrado, because this is a model that try to estimate a demand curve. So despite my dream of doing statistics, we do econometrics. What does it mean? That the variables that needs to be in that function needs to be coherent with an economic theory and the economic theory says that the demands depend on the cost on the cost of the substitute and income so if you voluntarily drop the income you voluntarily decide not to comply with the economic theory so a very moderate reviewer he would claim that your study is not good is not complying with the economic theory sometimes it's not significant you also have to justify why but if you do econometrics, you want to have the income. So, so in, other, in other scenarios, um, other variables that can be used, even instead of income ranges yeah. that have been used here in Colombia, for example, are stratos or CISBEN um, rankings, which are uh, an approximation to, um, to income. It's debatable, but that's how it is used sometimes. Because because the stratos is not for the people. You you don't have an strato. You your 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 house or your it's. But okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. a debatable approximation, but it's how it's done. Yeah. 
I would support this suggestion. We do the same in UK. <laughs> uh, no, especially you do the same when, uh, for example, you have surveys that are very condensed. So, and as Orlando was saying, there are quite issues to ask the, the income. So, because you have the postcode, the zip code of the respondent, then you can use the strata. So, then you assign an income that you are right. You can be living in a posh area but you are just there because your great-grandmother was very rich and you are very poor. It's just because you are by the chance there. Again, statistically speaking, let's suppose everything is working okay. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it's a solution in this case. So, um, but the income in theory should be there, okay? Uh, yes, okay, yes. Uh, before was not an issue. Now this, the postcode is an issue because you might be able to identify quite precisely the respondents, so we don't have access anymore to this. It's more aggregate. This is data protection uh, regulation, and uh, we, we go with what we've got, full stop. There's nothing we can do. Okay, uh, so the intuition is uh, people living uh, closer to the site, we have to visit more if all the other characteristics are exactly the same. So let's suppose me and Jaime are exactly the same, apart from the gender, doesn't matter, we are exactly the same. We do exactly the same job, we do exactly the same things, we like the same things, everything exactly the same. I do live in Cali, he does live in Bogota, and he visits more than me, okay? So that's what I should be able of doing with these methods. Then I can control for the other differences. So to formalize a bit, so we want to get this. We said this morning, I want to get a demand curve. How do I get this demand curve? Well, I've got the ingredient. I've got how many times I'm going to the park. I've got how much it costs me to go to the park. I should find some income to go to the park. This is the controversial one again. I should assign or I should find how much it costs for each of the respondent to go to the nearest substitute. So what is the substitute of Chingaza? Or you ask to the people, <laughs> or you ask to the people, so this morning when you set off to go uh, visit in the park, which other park you were considering? And Ima said, well, I'm, I was going in a different place. Or you assume something. So again, there is an assumption that you have to make. And then you have other variables that you want to control for. As yesterday, uh, was saying Corrado, this is the number of visits, all the other constant, this is my demand curve, this is the travel cost, so identify exactly what I need. Then I've got the welfare. So this is the setting of the scene, what I have to do, I have to do the survey, collect this information, go and calculate some distances and costs, and then I have to do a regression analysis. That's the, that's the business, okay? And after this exercise, I can calculate the welfare measures, okay, according to uh, my demand curve. And then I can say, if, for example, there is something going on and Chingaza shut down, what's the loss of this? So in principle, the national parks do not provide an evident stream of money, but people are traveling, so in some way, they express the importance of the site. So this exercise, provide what in the literature is called the uh, value of access. How much people are willing to pay to access the site on top of what they spent in uh, ice cream, equipments, and all the rest of it, okay? Uh, I'll go fast on this because this is the recipe, okay? So how we develop a travel cost single site. The travel cost, we already said, there are formal steps, but first of all, we have to design the site. Sometimes you see travel costs that are valuing everything and nothing. No, you have to be very precise. Why you have to be very precise? Because if you value uh, inside the national park, for example, I am just made it up, there is a wetland in Chingaza, okay? So do you want to know how many times people go to the wetlands specifically or they go to the park? 
There are two different questions, and you should get two different answers, okay? If you muddled up and people can design, can express what they want to do, then it's your business to understand what you are getting as a value, okay? Uh, then you have to understand why the people go there, okay? What's the recreation attraction? So you have to specify this because, uh, as we said, there are seasons, so and wetland can be, I don't know, attractive in six months, but not the other six months. So when you ask your question, you, ha you have to ask, how many times did you visit the park in the last six months, 12 months, one month? So th this horizon depends on the uses. Uh, because I have to do a, a questionnaire, here we got with the statistics, I have to do a sampling scheme. How should I go about asking the visitors, okay? Then I have to have in mind my model. This can be uh, controversial for the economist. Uh, why should I have the model in mind, even for a statistician, before collecting the data? Yes, I need to have this in mind before the model, before collecting the data, because if I need to ask someone a question that I think is important in the model later on, I need to know in advance, because when it's done, it's done. If, if you didn't ask the strata, for example, I don't ask the, I don't ask the, um, in theory, you ask the distance anyway, but let's suppose I want to have some information about the expenditure in equipment for visiting the park, because you think it's quite important. You have to have a question in the, in the questionnaire. So this is something that you need to be aware before you collect the data. Then you collect the data, uh, implement the survey, and then you estimate your model, and you can calculate what we said, the access value, okay? How important is your park? Um, so first of all, define clearly what you do. Second, what people are doing with this place. For how long you want to ask the visits? This again depends. And it's important in this case to ask why you are coming in this place, what you are doing, OK? Again, I came because I want to spend a day out with my fiance. It's different because you can be there just by chance. I came here to see the Andean bear, different uses of the park. Uh, then you have to define clearly the sampling scheme according to the season and the uses. Because let's suppose you want to get the bird watchers. But in that wetland, the birds are only in spring. So what's the point to do the survey in the winter? No one is going to visit that. So, also, the sampling scheme depends on what you want to get, uh, so they go together. Then we, we have the sampling scheme, and the sampling scheme, uh, the obvious one, is what we call the on-site. What do you mean? We go in the park, in theory, every day of the week, uh, every hour of the week, every access of the, of the parks. This is all in a dream. Statistically speaking, you have to be as random as possible. And once every 10 respondents, you, you add the enumerator, you see people passing by, you have a scheme, every 10 female you have to stop, every blah, 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 and you do your sampling scheme. This is the obvious way of doing it. It can be costly, especially in places where you don't have a, a clear access point. Uh, and then you have the enumerator standing there for hours and hours. You pay them for hours. It can be quite costly. And you have, um, um, Anyway, a uh, minimization of other costs because you are sure that you, you ask questions about how many times are you coming in this park, at least they said one. They are all visitors, okay? This is sure because you get just visitors if you do on site. Um, do you get to know when the people are not visiting what we call in economics this point, uh, the choke price? So, how far? How costly has to be for you for not coming to Chingaza? Can you get this from an on-site sample? No, because they're all visiting, okay? So this is an implication again. You can collect a decent number of respondents in a couple of weeks, it depends on the visitors, in, uh, in a couple of months, it depends, but you don't get this point on the curve. So, uh, uh, okay, this brings some, of course, technicalities in econometric terms. We can see that we can do uh, simple approaches to correct for this, but the econometrician can make a big deal about this problem. 
is a problem that you don't represent the population. So the idea uh, is to move and do an off-site sample. So what does it mean? That rather than standing in Shingaza, now you stay in Bogota and you have to call. We have to stop the people on the street and ask, have you been to Chingaza in the last 12 months? Yes, all many time, okay? So what's the chance to get a decent number of people that went there in the last 12 months? Tiny, 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 tiny. So you need to survey for months, 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 and months. But in that case, you get a good sense of oh, who is not visiting because it's too costly. And of course, I said Bogota, but you have to be broadly in other area, of course. Uh, and now the, the sample scheme is coherent with the uh, with valuing the chalk price, okay? So it's best to be off-site the site. Most of the time it's rare. People are stay inside the, the site, interview the people and move on. Uh, some solution sometimes is to access register of users, okay? So let's suppose you want to go bird watchers. There are different associations that have the mailing list of the um, associates. And so rather than stay in Shingaza, we contact each of them. In UK, it's not possible anymore. Data protection says that we cannot have individual emails anymore. So off of the discussion. Um, in other places, we hope they're more democratic. So you have a list of people. You send in a questionnaire, and they, they say, yes, I went to Shingaza. These times. So in this case, you get the choke price, you, you see uh, the offsite sample, but with minimum cost. This is an opportunity that I would consider. Um, okay, uh, the questionnaire per se is quite simple, quite standard. Uh, the um, tips are not too many questions. Uh, Economists and not just economists, when you have the opportunity to ask questions, you are very happy, so you want to ask many things. Try to be <laughs> as condensed as possible, ask the key information. Uh, it's good to have some sort of warm-up questions, uh, a, a, a tip of a very bad um, questionnaire is the following, and you can see this. So a questionnaire in um, data design principle is a conversation, is a structuring conversation of two people, okay? So a typical questionnaire that starts saying, can you tell me your income? Can you imagine approaching someone asking this question? It's not going to function, okay? So this warm-up question serves to sort of get friend, okay, before you go to the point. So this has to be embedded in the questionnaire. You want to test the questionnaire, okay? I said they are quite standard, but as our colleague said, cultural, local uh, values or settings are quite important. So what I mean by what do you use or what's your recreational opportunity it might mean something else. So have a sense of this. You might know the places very well, but otherwise you want to test it. Decide what to do with multiple sites, okay? Multiple visits. So I am in Chingaza for three days. So do I belong to the survey or I don't? Because maybe my visit to the park is spread on different activities. So how do I go about this? I divide the cost by three. You have to think about this uh, implication, okay? Um, survey, we said this. Okay, it's standard, of course, to have social demographic questions. Um, it's quite standard. Measuring the cost, as we said before, cost of traveling by, uh, by what you travel. So sometimes you do ask, did you travel by car? Did you travel by travel? My suggestion be as simple as possible. Okay? In some survey you say, oh, did you travel with a car of this capacity? Is better? Don't be fussy, okay? An average price is fine. Uh, you might want to, dis to di disentangle traveling by flight or uh, public transport or private transport if it's sin very significant, otherwise be simple. Uh, cost of time, uh, equipment costs and access fees to all this information you need to ask. Um, the cost of time, it can be assumed in different ways. So the simplest one that you can see, value zero. So we don't care about the opportunity cost of the time. Uh, the opportunity cost of time is 
a function of your wage, and this function of a wage can be controversial because you don't have a uh, wage, uh, or it can be some proportion of your wage, okay? The standard um, approaches in the literature, let's say the old fashioned, and I'll say why I'm talking about the old fashioned, is one third or half of the average of the individual wage rate, okay? So uh, your wage rate is 10 dollars per hour. The time that you spend traveling, the opportunity cost of traveling is worth three pounds or five pounds. Rule of thumb, okay? They've done some study about this, but this is what they use. This implies, however, that if you don't have a wage, because this is at the individual level, if you don't have a wage, your opportunity cost of traveling is zero, okay? This is the standard. Um, so this raises issues with your job type, it raises issues with people without a job. So in the UK, uh, the statistical office, of, uh, the National Office of Statistics is recommended three quarter of the average wage rate. What does it mean? You have your sample, from your sample you define the average wage rate of your sample, or can be of your uh, strata of the respondent, and of this average value, you get a three quarter. This has a, a benefit in, in, in some sense because people that don't work, they get a value. It's the three quarter of the average wage rate. The cons of this, the three quarter of the average wage rate can be quite more substantial than a third, okay? Uh, so you can test yourself that this assumption has important implication on the final value of your estimates. This again, you might not do any more travel cost in your life, but if you get to see a travel cost analysis, don't be fooled by the economist, okay? See these details, because the economy can inflate or underestimate estimates according to some assumption like this. Uh, a bit of statistics, not to scare you, but uh, as we have done yesterday, you can set a logarithmic setting. This is a semi-log. Uh, it looks complicated, but when we go to the technicalities, it's not much different from what we have done yesterday, okay? Now we have, rather than the quantity of the cacao, we have the number of visits. Rather than the cost of pesticide, we have your travel cost. You do the log of all of this, you estimate the parameter, and from the parameter, I'll see in the, in, the, in, the, in the next slide, you get the access value. To be fussy and to be precise, this is not the right way of doing it. So uh, economists, this is just for the economists, they have to use different specification. What's the downside of this? This specification are more complex. You cannot use Excel, you have to use other uh, software, and this model requires some understanding of what is going on. Um, what is important for us is what we get. What we get is, as yesterday, you remember yesterday we had the beta hat, to precise, so the, the parameter, the importance, uh, the opportunity cost that is measured by the travel cost, uh, the denominator of this fraction, multiply by two, give you the access value per visit to the site. So it means, how uh, what is the loss if I cannot visit my site over 12 months? This is the estimate, this is the willingness to pay. Okay, this is the measure that we want to get from a travel cost, a single site. Um, then you can aggregate, so this is a money value, so you can do whatever you want with this. So this is the money value that you want to communicate to your uh, policy makers or to the manager of the park to do their policy decision making. Then you can aggregate, oops, you can aggregate this for the population. So you say, for all people living in Bogota, the Chingaza Garden is worth this and that. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Silvia. Um, just uh, one short question. I was wondering if this the the willingness to pay what about the willingness to accept? In this case, it's just the willingness to pay because you do travel, so you spend. I, I, no, I see what you say. So you say, if I want to shut down the park, 
people are happy to receive a compensation for not doing it. Yes, so this number can be seen in positive and negative way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But in terms of calculation, it's exactly the same. Yeah, okay. Um, the single site travel cost per se, provide this information, is not the full information that we want to get because you may have question about but if the quality of my wetland is decreasing, what's the impact on the number of visits? You can't do it with a single site. So for doing this, you need two single sites. Or you need travel cost over time. So now you can see Tata, uh, Chingaza with this quality had this number of visitors. Chingaza with another quality had this number of visitors. So you need a time series of observation. So you can play with this method as you wish, okay? That's the message. So the key message is the single side that we describe, then you can go and be more complex in the way you structure this. Um, shall we do the break or shall we see the multi-site briefly? The multi-site is to be very briefly because it's too complex. Are you okay? Are you? Okay, survival function, you survive, good. Uh, <laughs> Multi-site is not much different in terms of what you have to do, the questionnaire and all the rest of it. What differ and is very important is this choice of alternatives. I said before, which are the uh, substitutes or which for me, when I decide to go to for me that I'm living in Cali, that's the scene, okay? I live in Cali, which are the national parks that belong to my basket. Do you know this? You don't know this, so you have to make some assumption about this. What, what about Jaime? So we have to decide. So this is the critical element about the multi-site because now you interview the people and you have to ask how many times have you been where? This is something that you have to define. And this where it can be flexible. As you see in this model, it can accommodate up to a thousand alternatives, okay? So all the national parks in Colombia, you have 50 something. So in principle, you ask how many uh, time have you been to each of the national parks? Is it credible that are all in the, in the basket? This is a question that is up to the respondent to answer when they set up the travel cost. Then, Whatever is your choice about the, the setting, for each of these choice sets, you have to uh, do the famous survey of the sites. So for each site, you need to know where they are, what they offer, what, which is the distance, and so on and so forth, okay? So in front of me is like to be in a, in a restaurant, okay? I've got a menu. And the menu says, this is vegetarian in this way, this is the price. This is uh, beef in this way, this is the price, blah, 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 blah. And then I select my option. So we have to set all of this. I can accommodate a choice set, so my sites is just mine. Jaime sites is just Jaime. Or we can have exactly the same number. This is flexible, you can decide what you want to do. Um, this type of model has been applied in UK from this survey, for example, that the, uh, this natu Natural England, uh, this is a government uh, association uh, that is working for the government but is dealing with the monitoring and uh, uh, provision and support of the environment. You can download, so if you want to play it with travel cost data, free of cost, you go on the Monitor of Engagement Natural England Survey, you download the data and you do your uh, travel cost, single site, multi-site, aggregate, you can do whatever you wish, okay? So these data were freely available. Uh, they cover, these are the dots, this is the um, equivalent of our sort of mun municipalities, okay? So you see the, sub the, the survey, the sampling scheme was all over England, okay? And it was done with a, an appropriate sampling strategy. So the, we have strata, we have probability, so it's a, it's a proper statistical sample. And for every sample, they ask people, how many times have you engaged with the natural environment in the last seven days? So it's a, it's a diary, okay? And for one site, at random, they ask question, where was the site? So they had uh, geographic location. So these are all the sites that have been surveyed, 
almost all the sites in UK. And uh, um, so they provide all this information. Of course, what you have to do? Now you have to link the visitors with the site. So now you have to define your menu for the choice set in front of each of them. So there was a lot of uh, data calculation, mainly done in GIS, a lot of assumption. But if you look at the um, second report that the UK has produced for the National Ecosystem Assessment, they are using this source of data to establish how much is the recreational value that natural size provide to the people. So when you talk about cultural recreational value of ecosystem services, this is the way it's been done from the UK. It's an intense activity because first of all, you need to have this data. Second, this data need to be processed. You need to set everything in a, in a modeling structure, a bit more complex than the one we discuss for single site. Uh, but what you get is quite important because what they've done in the National Ecosystem Ascension. So they said, this is the current welfare that you get from the natural sites, okay? What is happening in terms of welfare if the government, this was discussed, I don't remember if it went ahead or not, so the government was discussing the 25 year uh, plan that they wanted to do for the economy and the society in the UK. One uh, option was to increase the number of forests in uh, UK. UK has the highest uh, rate of deforestation in Europe, okay? Everything is farmland. So this is quite an issue, so they want to increase the number of forests. So what they've done, now we know how much is worth it to visit the different sites in the UK. So I want to plant new forests in the UK. As we know, there are always trade-offs. So if I plant a new forest in uh, a farmland that is quite valuable, so the cost opportunity of that piece of land is very high, is a bit of a problem because the value of the forest cannot cover the losses of the crops that I'm getting in that area. Second, people might enjoy uh, a forest in one location rather, rather than another location. So the question that the National Ecosystem Assessment was asking or was answering was, where should they put this forest? So they want to plant, don't remember the hectare, let's say a thousand hectare of maybe more, of forest. Where in UK? It's not a, a neutral question to answer. So using this model, they could simulate, they could anticipate the welfare value that you get in different location, and so guess what? Uh, the highest value is around London, around Birmingham, and so on and so forth. So of course, it's an anthropocentric valuation, so where the people are, higher is the value, okay? And it's also where the croplands uh, is not, so the farmland is not there, so of course the opportunity cost is low, the recreational value is high, so these are the locations that you want to prioritize to do the uh, Planting. So after this model has been implemented in the UK National Ecosystem Assessment, the government invested to make a tool. So now you can go and download this tool that is called Orval. I didn't report the link. I don't like the people that they develop. <laughs> they are my former colleagues, so, so there is some sort of, <laughs> but it's a clever, it's a clever tool, okay? And I'll give you the references in, uh, in, the, in the final slides. So they have done a tool now. So there is this application online, and what you can do, so you say, I've got this green area. Okay, people are visiting, they have a value for this. I shut down this area because I want to do a building. What's the loss of this? You can estimate this loss and you can make a sort of cost opportunity consideration in terms of planning of your urban area, okay? I argue that is a top desk assessment. I wouldn't invest my, my, my money in doing uh, a conversion of a piece of land using this tool. But as a desk awareness exercise is quite clever because you don't need to do any assessment yourself. You don't need to understand what multi-site is. Uh, as all the tools, you have to accept the black box uh, uh, offer and enjoy what you get. So this is what you can do with uh, travel cost. And this is the end of my presentation. I put a reference. I think this is quite important, more for the economists, but even for the others. This chapter is the best ever chapter 
written about travel cost, okay? It's very precise, it's very clear, and it's the best that you can get. So don't go around and look for many references, just use that chapter that's free available also, and you'd know enough how to do a travel cost.